and last shout out by way of introduction, and this is to Tricia and her team. Uh, we've had a fantastic working relationship uh, with John and Derek and the whole FMA team, so thank you to Sharon and Rose and James and the whole MB team, so thank you. And of course, Angus and the Code Working Group, thank you. Um, we're gonna invite them now to the podium, uh, so I will hop off the stage. Uh, this is a fantastic session, and it's really starting to shift the conversation on, we've got a new reg regime, how do we now build from here? So, Tricia, very warm welcome to you and your panel. Welcome. Um, it was actually 12 months ago, or virtually to the day, as Richard said, that we sat here and talked about preparing for a June 2020 FSLA regime, and then the world turned on its head, and in just short of around 20, 23 days, business days, we're going to have a new regime coming in on the 15th of March. So what I said to the panel when we were preparing for this, I don't really want to talk about the regulation and the legislation. It's in place and it is arriving on the 15th of March. What I really want to do is to ask the panel to provide us with their thoughts around what opportunities they see EFSLA brings uh, to investors and to advisors um, and to the whole of the financial services community. Um, I think it's about understanding how you as advisors can build your businesses, understanding the scope of advice, um, the value of advice, and I know that Sharon and her business partners have been working in that particular space, and I'll ask her to talk about that shortly, and then the benefits that that means for all New Zealanders. Uh, I spoke to a number of advisors before coming along and doing this and said to them what what was 2020 like around your preparation, knowing that you had a new date in place? And they said it was basically, the summation was that it was a springboard for them to be able to position themselves about how to market themselves and their businesses. And I was also privy, uh, because I do work for a bank, and, um, and I was able to listen to a lot of contact centre calls, but I was also listening to my friends and family and the community at large, about you know, what was happening in 2020. And surprisingly enough, a lot of us in this room, including myself, had already been through a lot of financial milestones, crisis events, credit crisis, et cetera, et cetera. But this pandemic, what it did show, and, and it's backed up by research from the FMA, they did a, um, some consumer research, it's backed up by Money and You, which the FSC have done, and um, also what the Commission for Financial Capability have done, and is that those people that have got advice, took advice, were able to approach their advisors during 2020 were the people that were the least vulnerable. And so the people that didn't have advice, didn't know where to access it, don't understand the value of it, it's our job in this room to do that, and it's our job for me to get the panel to unpick that today. Um, I particularly also want to talk to Angus about the code, um, the principles-based code that he has talked about on many occasions has been deliberately worded to address all situations. And I talked yesterday about wanting to get um, Angus's thoughts around the behaviours and attitudes around Code Standard 3, so the suitability of advice, and Code Standard 4, the client understanding of it. So we will go through that as well. Um, interestingly, yesterday we got picked up in a taxi from um, Sky Stadium in Wellington to go to the airport. And the taxi driver said, oh, you know, you look pretty important, you people. Um, what, what are you doing there? And I said, oh, it was a conference. She said, uh, what was it about? I said, oh, financial services. She said, so it was government. I went, no, 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 private sector. She said, oh, she said, um, I've got a bit of money. She said, were you talking about investing? And I said, yes. She said, I've got a bit of money I want to invest. And she said, so I'm, I'm going to take the plunge. And I said, oh, OK. I said, the best thing I can give you is a tip. Uh, I can't give you any advice, but the tip is you should take some financial advice. And she kind of looked at me and she said, why would I do that? She said, it's really easy. And so it, it occurred to me, she didn't know where she could access the advice. She didn't think she had enough money. She said, I've only got a bit of money. Uh, that she didn't need to take advice because it, it just wasn't going to be worth an advisor's job to talk to her. And, and she discussed it all the way to the airport then. We did KiwiSaver, we did everything, the whole world. And I think I left her totally confused 
that was she making the right decision and thinking that she could do it herself? And so that's what I really want the panel to, to prove to our taxi driver lady, Elaine, that that's what she should be doing, taking advice. Because we, we want the community to have confidence and respect and faith and trust in the advice that we give. And we want you as advisors to be able to go out there, meet your obligations, do your day job, and do it really, really well. So um, I'm really interested in your questions from Slido. We were had a plethora of them yesterday, and I grouped them as, as I could, and I'll try and do that today. I've got one that I will ask John when he's um, done um, his little opening uh, address, but please um, send them through to me. So um, what I am going to do is ask the panellists to give us about two or three minutes each um, of their kind of thoughts now, post uh, 15th of March. Um, 2021. So I'm going to start off with um, Sharon, and then we'll go to Derek, and then we'll go to Angus, and then we'll go to John. So over to you. Cool, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's really great to be here again. Um, it is this, this summit um, series is very much like deja vu, um, and that's not because I did it in Wellington yesterday, uh, but because uh, it was almost exactly a year ago that I was sat on exactly this couch and we were giving a countdown until the new regime was going to come into force. Um, but obviously a lot has changed in the last year, and I think 2020 has really illustrated the value and importance of financial advice. Um, so as soon as COVID started hitting our shores, I was getting calls from industry associations like the FSC, and I was hearing directly from financial advisors about the impact that COVID was having on your sector. And above all else, what I was hearing was that financial advisors needed to be, at that time, really focusing on their clients, answering questions like, should I be moving to a more defensive KiwiSaver fund, or answering questions about their um, insurance coverage, for example. So the FSC told me that some of their member call centres were at that time experiencing a 300% increase in call volumes and that calls were lasting five times longer than normal. And we now know, looking at what transpired last year, that those people who were getting financial advice were ultimately better off. So for example, Financial Advice New Zealand did some research which found that almost half of those receiving advice believe that they were better off financially and better able to deal with the effects of COVID-19 than they would have been without that advice. 2020 has also unfortunately illustrated that many more New Zealanders could benefit from getting advice. The Commission for Financial Capability undertook a survey during the nationwide Level 4 lockdown um, and that they found that at that stage, 66% of New Zealanders were financially exposed or in financial difficulty. So here we are in 2020. This time uh, we have around one month to go until the new regime comes into force. Um, but when I look ahead and I think about the financial advice sector in the next five to 10 years, I feel great optimism. And I know that preparing for this new regime has been an enormous undertaking with so many different elements for you to think about and changes to your businesses. But fundamentally, the new regime aims to improve access to financial advice and confidence in advice. So we've all seen that value that financial advice has provided to New Zealanders over the past year, and that's really shown us all the value of advice. So the new regime aims to build on that by providing assurance to consumers that advisors need to prioritise their interests, need to comply with a code of conduct, and need to operate under a licence granted by the FMA. So what I really like is that from March the 15th, the message to the public can be really clear and simple. Everyone giving advice is held to the same standards. Gone are those mind-boggling permutations of different standards depending on um, who you go to for advice, what product they're advising on, and whether or not the advisor is taking into account your personal circumstances. So I guess overall, 2020 has highlighted to New Zealanders, I think, the benefit of getting their finances in order. And in this context, financial advice has the potential to improve the financial well-being of so many New Zealanders. And I hope that in turn, that will contribute to a thriving financial advice sector. Thanks. Derek. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, um, Sharon. So um, really in trying to meet Trish's challenge today, I'm going to try and not sound like a regulator, at least for two or three minutes. <laughs> we'll see how we go. So I really want to just touch on a couple of things. One is uh, just acknowledging that we are really, in many respects, handing the baton over to you in terms of the new regime. And I just want to touch on what that really means. But secondly, I want to use mostly my time, the two or three minutes, to talk about what I think is a key issue is how do we encourage more consumers um, to seek advice? And what are the barriers and how can we overcome them? And one of the questions I have is if we have bolder conversations as a sector around advice and the, the meaning of money in our lives, will that help to break down some of those barriers? So firstly, starting with the handing over the, of the baton to you in certain respects, um, Sure, the new regime has made a whole host of changes um, that address a lot of the issues of the past. But I think that you know, what I get a sense of, that as we hand that baton over, there's an enormous amount of confidence, enormous amount of confidence in the room because we know that um, those that seek financial advice are better off. But also, the research shows, and I think this is interesting, particularly in the difficult times in the last year, is that we know that people who seek financial advice, their whole general well-being is better off. And I think that's something that we need to think more about and consider and talk more about because I think that's really important. But like I said, I think this is the time and this is the opportunity now to think about how we address that problem. How do we encourage more people to seek advice? And I think that really from my perspective, I think that part of the problem is that we don't like to admit to ourselves that maybe we could do better financially than we really are. Maybe we feel a little bit embarrassed by that. Maybe we feel that we're going to be judged if we see a financial advisor. And probably all of us have this tendency to ignore information that makes us feel bad. And it was interesting because the money in you research showed that many of us uh, think we're in a better financial position than we really are. And I thought that was quite fascinating. And I think that requires probably a positive approach from the advice sector. It's not only just talking about where people have gone wrong, but maybe it's also talking about what people are doing well and how, how they can do better. And in having that conversation, I do think we've got to break that myth. And that's the myth that only certain people in certain circumstances would benefit from advice. Because from my perspective, I think no matter what um, walk of life, no matter how successful you've been, all of us can um, benefit from financial advice, and I think that's something we need to be talking more about. So I suppose, in a sense, I think that we need to normalise getting um, advice. We need to make it OK for people to feel that it's OK to get advice. And we need to start talking more and sharing more stories about uh, money in our lives and what the meaning of money in our lives and separate money from our emotional lives. And I've heard it's been spoken before, and I rather like it, which is, there's a distinction between money troubles and money worries. So money troubles are the things that can only really be solved by more money, where money worries are the things that are going on in our head. And I think we need to have more conversation around that sort of disentangling that psychological from, from the money side of things and, and be more real, have more vulnerable sort of conversations and be more um, relatable in doing that. So it was interesting that really over the Christmas holidays, um, my teenage son decided to invest a very small amount of Christmas money um, through an online platform. And what was interesting was really what happened next. So he, he's done a small amount of investment and then he starts to receive um, these really bite-sized digestible bits of information about the market from the provider. And what was interesting was that it was really accessible information and it met an unstated hidden want. If you'd asked him, he probably would never have actually said this or even admitted to it, but actually it's what he wanted. He wanted to learn more, experience more, get information that was easy for him to understand and then it kind of started conversations around the dinner table and I was very, very quickly, as you can imagine, tested on some of this stuff and um, having these really interesting conversations. But I think there's something in that though is that maybe if we're less puritanical about how we define needs and wants and maybe, um, and realise in this case with that psychological need to learn more and to understand more and tease that out and meet that need, we go a long way. So anyway, I hope that's, Tricia, met some of your challenge. Thanks, Derek. Angus. Kia ora. <coughs> uh, 
Derek and Tricia and Tenakoto, everyone, everybody in the room and everybody the other side of technology. I've got to start off by saying exactly what I said in Wellington. It is fantastic to see people face to face. It's wonderful to walk through a room and recognise faces and um, having lived on Zoom like I'm sure most of you have done um, for the last year, it's just nice to be person to person. And that's spoken as a non-extrovert person, believe it or not. Hey, I want to, uh, there's only one topic I want to talk about today, and that is the flexibility of the code. But I'm, I'm going to slightly sort of rejig what I was going to say, just picking out Trisha's story, because we were in different taxis. We had a, a, a much more boring taxi uh, ride, and we didn't talk about financial advice. But it caused me to reflect on when I went and first got, or when we first went and got financial advice. And you know, I'd gone through virtually all of my life thinking, well, particularly with finance, I can sort things out myself, a bit like my attitude to being a home handyman, and I should have learned my lesson from that because I'm not a very good home handyman. And it was only when a problem occurred that, you know, in panic, I went to a financial advisor, and it has made immeasurable difference to my financial life. And I think that's the thing about financial advice. It means different things to different people, and it crops up at different par parts of your life cycle. And yes, you know, different advisors might argue that you can plan different things in a financial advice journey, but a lot of it is accidental and depends on the circumstances of the client. So that was prompted by uh, Trisha's stor story then, and it leads nicely into this topic that I want to talk about, which is the flexibility of the code. So when Sharon's team built the legislation, one of their chief focuses, as Sharon has touched on, was to reduce the, the different barriers in the legislation. So get away from you know, some advice for certain types of products and different advice for other types of products. This notion of class advice. By the way, if anybody is unsure, class advice has gone. So from the 15th of March onwards, there's no such thing as class advice. So when you hear Australians talking about general advice, there is no equivalent in, there will be no equivalent in New Zealand. So that's all gone. When you hear people here and um, across the Tasman talking about limited advice or scaled advice or you know, different types of packages of advice, that all goes. That doesn't apply anymore. So here Sharon's team has built this platform where, like everything's the same, there are no barriers. How does it then work? Uh, well, that became a problem for the code working group. That was something that we had to grapple with. Now, of course, it wasn't a viable solution to say that every time there's an advice interaction, no matter how simple, you have to do you know, a full-scale piece of advice. So we had to build in principles and we had to build in scalability within the code. So you end up doing exactly the same things but to different levels and in different amounts, depending on the circumstances of, the, of advice. So in a sort of weird way, you're, every piece of advice follows the same principles, but every piece of advice is unique in its depth and breadth. So how is this accomplished? And I've got to be careful here because I'm sort of surrounded by the FMA and they'll um, make sure that I don't, don't sort of <coughs> stray too far from the bounds that they're, that they're happy with. So the actual control sits outside the code. In the legislation itself, there's a requirement in any, any occasion when you give advice to make sure that the client under, understands the nature and scope of advice. If there's anything like a get out of jail free card in the legislation, that is it. If you do not clearly scope your uh, advice with your client and make sure that your client understands the parameters of that advice, you are asking for trouble. So if there is only one thing you get right when giving advice, it is clarity with your client about the scope of advice. And that doesn't matter whether it's a call centre person speaking on the phone, it doesn't matter whether it's digital advice, it doesn't matter whether, when you've got sort of full advice, to use the old terminology, where you're spending a long time with the client. The client needs to understand the parameters about what's in and what's outside the advice. Then the code kicks in. And the code standards need to be read together. They all complement each other. You, you can't just answer a problem about the code by referring to one standard. You've got to, got to look at them all. And the two standards that Tricia mentioned are indeed key client care standards. Standard three being make sure the advice is suitable um, for, for the client. 
and uh, standard four being make sure the uh, client understands the actual financial advice that they get. And we could speak for hours about both of those things. But when you read those two standards, and if you haven't had a chance to reflect on them recently, I'd, I'd encourage you to go and look at them again before the 15th of March. You will see the language that we've used both in the standards themselves, because every standard has a standard, and in the commentary that is under the standard, we have tried to build in flexibility. We've tried to build in ways that you can uh, increase and decrease what you do depending on the circumstances. So how, how do you show particularly how do you show to the FMA, if the FMA comes knocking, how do you show that you've sort of gone far enough? Well, the counterbalance is another code standard, and that's code standard one, treat clients fairly. And that code standard works in two different directions. Firstly, you can't artificially narrow what the other standards are doing so far that you get to a point where you're not being fair to your client. You still have to check in with yourself to say, okay, well, if I've, my nature and scope is this, and this is how I'm approaching making sure that this advice is suitable for my client, is there trickery going on here? Am I hoodwinking my client, or am I actually treating the client fairly? And that is not a generic answer. You need to think about the specific client. If it's a client with vulnerabilities, you might need to go a bit further. But equally, treating clients fairly goes in the opposite direction. It's a um, a protection against overdoing it. So if your response to code standard three and code standard four is I must always do this long checklist of things and I must do it to this degree of depth, well, you're actually not reading the regime correctly because the regime is intended to be fle flexible and the flexible part of the regime is indeed the code. So you need to, to think from that treat client fairly point of view is am I overdoing it with this client? Am I really going over the top in terms of trying to build protections in with this client? Or can I settle on you know, a less bureaucratic interaction with the client because that is more than enough for making sure that I'm treating this client fairly? So I hope, you, I hope that gives you a little bit of a, an idea, a spirit of what the code is trying to achieve. Now, Trish, I know I've gone on a little bit and I'll just quickly wrap. The code went to the minister for approval two years ago this month, so everybody's had a lot of time to look at it. But actually, we need to move away from a get in shape type thinking to a get on with it <coughs> type thinking. We need you guys to try out the code, and we need to, the code working group will become the code committee from the 15th of March. We need to hear back from you about what's working well, what's not working well. But what I don't really want to hear back is there's too much flexibility, there's too much uncertainty. That flexibility is there to help you, and you need to be bold enough to use it. So thank you. So back to Tricia and Thanks, John. Angus. John. Thank you. Thank you, Angus. Thank you, Tricia. Uh, Morena, everyone. Um, very, very nice to be back here with you um, at, um, in Eden Park. And lots of familiar faces. Um, uh, in Wellington yesterday, um, I happened to um, meet with or reconnect with um, someone I worked with um, more than 20 years ago. And she said to me, gee, your kids were really small then. I, I suppose by now you must be a granddad. And I go, well, it might feel like it, but um, not, not quite yet. Um, I, I can say that um, wee Bonnie is on her way and the stalk has been um, booked for uh, early June. So we certainly are looking forward um, to that. Um, as I said, it's been a relatively long journey. I think we uh, first probably met with you all here back in um, 2017. And since then, my travelling companion, Mr Derek, um, keeps asking me, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Um, <laughs> well, Derek, nearly. Um, there's 22 working days to go um, from today um, to get us to the um, 15th um, of March. I think back here also in 2017, I may have suggested to you a form of competition to see who we could give license number 0001 to. Um, what I can tell you um, as of uh, early this week, we now have more than 2,200 firms um, who are license ready. And within those firms, um, more than 9,600 um, financial advisors um, so 
congratulations, well done um, to all of all of you, um, I would have said, who are well on the road um, and getting ready um, for the new regime. Um, so really what I'd like to do is, is really just to, to thank you, thank you advisors um, for putting in the hard yards um, to get us where we are um, through today. And I'd also like actually to thank Sharon um, and her team at MB um, for the amount of en engagement um, that they've put in um, sort of through this journey with us as well. And I think as a result of that we can all consider ourselves as being architects um, of the new regime. But what I'd like to just do is um, spend a couple of minutes also just talk about um, sort of three myths um, to explore just a little bit with you. Um, and the, f the first one is um, the ageing advisor. And so I'll, I'll just grab my notes so I get my statistics right um, to talk to you about that. So 60% of today's um, advisors are aged 50 um, or under. 30% are aged between 51 to 65. 7% are over 65. And 3,500 advisors are aged under 40. So I was quite surprised to see the statistics and actually quite delighted to sort of think of the number of younger people that we actually do have in the industry. And certainly we all together um, need, need to continue sort of with that journey around encouraging more and more people um, into the industry. And whilst it's true we still, or you need to sort of look at um, sort of succession plans um, within your business, but it's simply not true to say that we are all um, greying and ageing um, as advisors um, through the industry. The other one was the death of the solo advisor um, through licensing. And by solo advisor, I mean businesses where the owner um, is the only one um, working in the business. And the licensing statistics that we have so far tell us that 52% of all licenses granted so far are actually to solo um, advisor businesses. So, the threat, I think, that a lot of us thought that smaller businesses would actually either disappear or be bought out by some of the larger firms who are just finding it difficult to grow organically uh, would start to acquire smaller businesses. So it, it is not happening. So I think um, as a, if you are a um, solo, solo advisor, um, you are a force to be reckoned with. Um, so think about that and consider that. And when we look at the commercialities that we have within um, this business and, and, how, and how it runs, then be proud and stand up um, for yourself. The last was the term um, holistic advice. Now I have no problem with what um, holistic advice actually is. But for the life of me, I could not understand if anyone went to a client and said, we are now going to do something called holistic advice. I have no idea why the term seems to get um, bandied about and comes out of the woodwork every time there's a crisis um, in the market, and COVID is no different. So the language around delivering holistic advice um, seems to re-emerge all the time. And I simply come back to the fact and think about exactly what advice is, and advice is you as an advisor building relationship with your client, you're a counsellor uh, working through with them, you're a partner with them and trying to make some really, really important decisions for them around their financial lives, whether it's borrowing or protecting um, or investing. So why don't, you know, for once and all, why don't we get rid of these ridiculous terms and actually just call things um, what, they, what they really are? But I said one thing that advice is not, and that is selling, so those days are well and truly um, gone. Out of that, I'll just, just leave you with the, the thought um, around um, what do you think it might be like to be my financial advisor? So when I started um, sort of talking to my wife Jo around um, getting financial advice, she looked at me and said, what for? She said, don't you know all this stuff? Um, why can't we just rely on what you say um, that we should do? 
And so we had our first meeting with the financial advisor and immediately at the end of it she expressed to me that's most, the most boring thing I'd actually ever <laughs> been through. Um, can we please stop? <laughs> um, so we persevered and went you know, through, through the process um, and we learned a, an awful lot about who we were, you know, what, what we spend, sort of, you know, what it means for us as well. So we, we now no longer just find money when we need to do things. We actually think about things. We actually have a, we have a plan. We understand where it is that we want to go and we're in control. And the best thing out of all of that is it actually is no longer me, it's now we. Thank you, Tricia. Thanks, John. John, I just want to touch on a point that you raised. You've received 2,200 licences across 9,600 advisors. So how comfortable are you, um, are, are the FMA, in that the people that are not ready now will get across the line? Um, and I guess I'm interested in any words of advice. And then I've received a question that says, the FMA won't know which facts engage which financial advisors until the 15th of June. Mm -hmm. So they're really interested about that first three months of the regime. So two points to that question, really. Um, th those that aren't ready, confidence around that, and then the th first three months. Okay, thank you, thank you Tricia. <laughs> just, just unbundle those uh, numbers um, a little bit. I mentioned 2000, over 2,200 firms that are ready. Um, so within that, there are 1,467 approved licences as at um, Tuesday of this week, um, 774 authorised bodies who are working for those licensed firms, um, and as I said, those um, financial advice providers or the authorised bodies uh, between them, as I said, are engaging more than 9,600 um, financial advisors. Um, and I think somewhere around 12,500 nominated uh, representatives. We are still, in our discussions, um, there are people that um, still talk to us um, about how do they license um, and what they um, need to do. But I mean, we still are receiving license applications um, on a daily basis. And um, my message to those people who are still deciding um, there is very, very little time left. So now is the time to take action, um, if, if that is you. And just in regards, you know, for whatever reason, if you think that this new regime does not apply to you as a financial advisor, then please think again. We have come across advisors um, who tell us that they don't believe they need, they need to be licensed, excuse me, um, because they no longer prospect for new clients. They no longer engage any new clients, but they have an existing book of clients that they continue to engage and communicate with. Uh, sorry, if you are one of those, you will need a license um, to continue to give advice um, to your current clients. There are a number of advisors as well who um, talk to us about um, their ongoing remuneration um, that they are um, continuing um, to get from product providers. Again, same situation where they're no longer um, talking to new clients. Well, your product provider, if they haven't already, I'm sure will be in touch with you very soon to ask you what your license status, status is moving forward. Do not put yourself in a position come 16th of March where you find that your revenue has stopped. Um, so have the discussion with your product provider around what the appropriate course of action um, is um, for you. So let me be very clear um, with everyone today, and that is we will be tracking every authorised and registered financial advisor today to follow your licence status through on the FSPR. If you are operating outside of the law, we will take enforcement action. Now, in the period between the 15th of March and I said the 15th of June, there is the opportunity for you and your um, financial advice provider, we just said, you make the connection on the register. So the financial advisors and um, FAPs will connect through onto the register, but come 15th of March, you must be operating under the new regime. You must be work, either hold a licence or work for someone 
um, who has a licence. The 90 days is simply the opportunity for you to do the paperwork um, that comes through. And I've said that is the process we will go through to check um, sort of through that period. So I said, if you're still uncertain, there are a very short number of days left in which you can take action. Um, please do get in touch um, with us at the FMA. Um, you can ask us um, questions, questions at fma.govt.nz. Um, have a look at our website. Um, there's a lot of material there to help you. Um, have a look at um, MB's uh, website as well. Have a look at the company's office website. Um, that'll tell you all about what you need to do on the FSPR and how to register. Again, there are links on those sites um, that you can link through to, to be able to talk to people who are gonna be able to help you. Talk to your professional advisor association. Um, again, a lot of very, very valuable and good information um, to help you um, through there as well. So just on that, just take the brief opportunity to go and I know we have people here today um, from FMA and MB and the company's office. Can I quickly just ask everyone from FMA to please stand up and quickly wave to the crowd. Thank you. Uh, these are the people you should be talking to. MB, can you please do the same as well? Rose, thank you. And company's office um, as well. So these are the people. Uh, that you need to talk to straight after this session um, if you need to. And I can also tell you this is now going to cost me dearly tomorrow in the office. <coughs> Thanks, John. I know Sharon just wants to... I was just going to say, I know the company's office has a stand out there. So if you're not sure how to do the linking after the 15th of March, they've got a brochure that goes step by step through it and a QR code that links to a video that shows you step by step how to do the linking. So visit the company's office stand if you've got a question about that. John, you answered a number of questions that were around commissions from product providers, were around what happens after 15 March, so I've ticked off about six questions there. The next one I'm going to throw to you, um, Sharon, um, because we were talking yesterday about your work that you're doing around the value of advice, and there's a really good question here that I think kind of dovetails into it, because I remember Angus also saying yesterday, don't tell anyone that advice is free. So this question is two barriers to overcome. Firstly, we need to clarify the benefits of getting advice, but also that good advice is something worth paying for. It seems the expectation is that it's for free, or if it's charged, it's likely to be biased. So I guess if you can weave that into your conversation about the value of advice um, as well, and then I'm not sure if you want to comment, uh, Angus. Yeah, cool. Um, so FMA and MB and the Commission for Financial Capability, we're working together at the moment on a bit of a um, kind of comms plan out to consumers to promote the value of advice and the value of the new regime. Um, so, like, you know, so far throughout this review, we've been doing a lot of talking to advisors. Um, I'm sure you're, you're sick of the sight of all of us, but we want to really turn our attention in the new regime to talking to consumers about the value of advice. Um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, the good thing from a marketing perspective is that it's a really simple story. Go get advice, your advisor will be held to the same standards no matter where you go. Um, so that's the kind of consumer protection side of the story. The other part of it is really selling the value of advice and telling some of those stories like examples where in 2020 people who got financial advice were better off. Um, so we're working on a bit of a comms plan on how we might all collectively get that message out there post the 15th of March. Um, there's a role, I think, for the government and for the regulator, but obviously also a role for financial advisors and for the sector. Um, but I'm really happy if industry associations or anybody has ideas about how we can work together. Um, what we really need is consistent messages. Um, so if we can work together to get good stories out there to consumers, then um, please, I'm all ears, come, come to me with your ideas. So I'll, I'll just uh, yes. res rescue Angus. <laughs> Tricia, I was the one yesterday who talked about not, not telling your clients that um, advice um, is free because I think that undermines the value of your conversation you're going to have um, around giving advice. So if you tell someone something is free, I suspect they're really not uh, going to, to value it. But the one thing I just sort of want to mention is, um, is trust. So 
come 15th of March and we're in the new regime, we as regulator are going to trust you, advisors, to be doing the right thing um, with your clients. Um, so believe, it, believe in the trust and when it comes to things around um, whether, whether you get remunerated because you get um, commissions you know, or a product provider pays you, I don't, I don't have any problem um, with that. It's only reasonable that you should be paid fairly for the work that you do and you run businesses and it's fair to expect your businesses should be profitable. Um, and that you can make a decent living um, out of it is sort of, you know, sort of what, what you do. But that becomes a conversation then with your customers as to the mechanisms of advice and how things work together. Um, and I said, we have trust in you as well that says, you know, that's a fair way for you to be remunerated. It's, it's okay if you don't represent a large number of product providers when you're having discussions with your clients. Um, that's all about talking to your clients about what, what that means, being transparent, being quite open um, around some of those conversations um, as well. So we, as I said, our trust in you is that we are not going to immediately think that you are conflicted because of the way you are enumerated. We are not going to think that you're conflicted because you only offer you know, one product provider's um, products. We, we have more trust in you than that, that you're actually going to really consider and think about the advice process and everything that this new regime actually delivers to you actually have positive outcomes and positive attributes for your customers, so embrace it. Thanks, John, and thanks um, for all the questions, especially from our digital community. Um, John, no surprises here. You raised about the solo advisors. I've got a number of questions here around PI. So um, I guess just your observations, thoughts around that and the challenges that are currently in the marketplace. Yep. Um, PI cover was a, a very, very interesting when we first went to you and talked to you about standard conditions within a licence and you know, what were your thoughts on whether or not we should make um, holding PI cover mandatory um, for businesses. And it's probably out of um, all of the questions we asked, we received most submissions um, on that question. And pretty much 50-50 balanced between those of you, and, and I must admit that in the 50-50, you were well and truly at, in either camp, nothing in between. So a lot argued um, sort of well around the why you shouldn't have it and why um, you should have it. A lot of the professional groups lobbied very hard um, on that issue um, as well. So we, we made the decision um, in the end that um, f we felt it better for you as businesses to be able to make the decision for yourselves around how you run your businesses, whether you thought it was appropriate for you to have cover or not. We didn't feel that it was appropriate for to use regulation to tell you um, what you should do um, in that regard. Um, the market has said it's a commercial market. Um, we understand in our research that we have done, uh, particularly in the UK as well, um, and sort of talking to some global underwriters, um, it is fair to say um, they, they are re-rating the risk on PI cover around the world, so it's not just sort of happening through here, and underwriters are, are, are looking at that and understanding where it is that they want to be in the market. Um, what it's going to come down to from a pricing perspective, the sorts of things that they are going to cover um, sort of through there as well. So I think the, the market, I said, is still considering um, and working through um, those, those options um, sort of through there um, as well. So let's see what happens over the coming months um, as to what cover is available. Um, but I'm very interested and we will continue to have discussions with product providers here and overseas to do the best that we can to ensure you know that there, uh, there is cover available it's a, we are regulated we can't interfere in uh, commerciality of what what this means but i'm i'm just interested to make sure from a pricing perspective that what cover is available is affordable um, for your businesses as well thanks john 
Angus, getting back to uh, one of your favourite uh, code standards here, standard <laughs> four, the question is what information do we record to evidence compliance? So is it that clients email us and say, yes, I understand, or do advisors record that the client appears to understand it? So if you can kind of flesh that out a bit, please. So, so I suppose the starting comment is in this regime there's a spectrum of um, compliance precision, if you like. So there are things in the regime where there's clear you know, certainty as to whether you or not you've complied. So for example, some of the things around the licence you've either complied with or you haven't complied with. Then there are some things in the middle um, that you know, have elements of tick box but also require a bit of discretion as well where compliance is a little fuzzier and the, for example the disclosure regs are a bit like that. You, know, you can tell whether somebody's complied with the disclosure regs but there is some latitude uh, around the edges. And then you get to the code, including Code Standard 4, and it's, if you like, the fuzziest part when it comes to compliance precision. Now, the starting point is the regulator is going to be far more persuaded that you're trying to do the right thing if down the spectrum with the things that you should be able to demonstrate you've complied with, you've got those right. So if your house is in order, you've got the license right, you, you've done your best job over the disclosure regs and those sorts of things, you're going to have a much more positive interaction with the regulator when it comes to the fuzzier points. And then within the code, there is plenty you can do to e evidence what, what you're doing. It's just not as tick box. It might be recording that you've done something. It might be recording an, an observation. Sometimes it might be some form of correspondence and, and so forth. Where code standard four gets complicated is it swings the balance around because you need to make sure the client understands the financial advice. So. You've got to do something, if you like, to get into the head of the client. Now, again, go and read the words of that standard because there is flexibility built in there. It's not an absolute requirement, but you need to have done reasonable things to think about it from the client's point of view. So that suggests um, a degree of two-way flow between you and the client. It's not just you telling the client, it's you checking in with the client about how the client has received the messages from you. So it's not just passing over information, it's checking how that information has got to its destination, to, to the client. Now, the code doesn't limit how you do that. I acknowledge in some situations, and I'm actually thinking less about when you're dealing with a human advisor and more about digital advice, in some situations, that's actually quite a challenge. But we thought it was appropriate to have in the code. You know, advice is all about that connection with the client and giving the client a helping hand. So you need to be able to, you know, think about it from the client's point of view and evidence how you have at least attempted to think about it from the client's point of view. Trisha, I don't know whether that's enough, but... No, that, that's fine. Thank you. Um, we've got about five minutes left, and so I do want to really get back to you, Derek, because I have a number of questions here, and I guess the summation of those is, as a market, do you think we need to think more differently about advice and how to deliver it in a more simple, effective way? So, and then I guess that leads into, you know, how do we encourage new advisors to come into the industry? Because we have lots of questions about capacity, and we know that there aren't enough advisors out there for advice. So I guess the first part, it doesn't need to be done more simply, and then how do we encourage new advisors? Yeah, look, both um, really, really interesting questions. I'll, I'll start with... Um, how do we encourage more people into the, into the sector? Because that's something I re feel really passionate about. And I think that as a sector, some of the things we need to be thinking about is what are the things um, that we do that might actually discourage rather than encourage people to join the sector? And so how do we sort of, what's the culture? How do we operate? Because I think sometimes do we have a tendency to be a bit of a closed shop? Um, do we um, discourage new people from joining? Do we... Um, do things like not help people as much as we could. And I think that my experience in the industry in the past is that sometimes we fear that someone's going to eat our lunch, so we're not prepared to really help new people join. We're not really prepared to share information about the sector and about what we do. Um, and we're not very good at telling necessarily all the stories about what we do and 
and the good that we do. And so I think that we need to think more as a sector about what are the things that we might be doing that discourages people from joining from different walks of life. And I'm really glad that John's been able to do, sort of blow up that myth about um, you know, an ageing sort of advisor force because that's not correct. And, and I think that's, um, and that's a really good testament to the sector in terms of you know, it has got the ability to bring lots of people from lots of different walks of life into it. Um, and so I think we need to tell more stories about how good um, advice is and what we do. So I think that would be my sense of that. And absolutely right, we need to um, be thinking, and I think this is a critical issue in the new regime, and Angus has touched on it really rather well, which is how do we make sure that our advice is targeted to the need so that we can get it, if we get that balance right, we can deliver affordable, accessible advice. And so it's around that notion of that co the co standards around the suitability of advice, but also the making sure the scope, the client understands the scope of advice. And one of the things that I was thinking about with the client understanding the advice um, is being able to think again about what are the barriers to the client understanding the advice. And, and I had the opportunity to deal with another profession just recently on a personal basis where the professional very quickly slipped into using jargon. Now, the jargon, as it so happened, I understood the jargon. But nevertheless, it wasn't the way that I would normally talk about those kinds of issues. And somehow I felt disconnected from the conversation. I started to feel like I was losing a bit of confidence. And so one of the things that I would suggest when you're thinking about barriers to clients understanding advice is to think about the language that you use and how you explain um, what the concepts and what you do. Um. After morning tea this morning, you're going to see a video of two fabulous ladies from Australia, and they talk a lot about the jargon right. side of it. So um, that adds to that message. We've run out of time. Thank you for the questions. We've got people coming in from Fitianga and Fongamata on holiday, so that's great. The digital community are joining us. Um, I've got two minutes for each of you now. Um, a question I had prepared, but also it's been asked by a number of people. I guess coming to, into this new regime, what were your biggest fears? What are your biggest surprises? And what are you most proud of? Sure. Cool. Um, yeah, I was, I was saying yesterday, um, actually, this review of the Financial Advisors Act, it started back in 2014. I think it was right at the end of 2014. And I can still remember really vividly this particular seminar. It was, it was right near the start of the review. Um, a big seminar in Auckland, maybe a couple of 100 financial advisors. And the, the passion in the room was absolutely palpable. And um, there was absolutely some anger in the room and some fear and also some excitement. And I think almost everybody, even back then, agreed that the Financial Advisors Act in its current form wasn't actually working that well. It was standing in the way of good advice. But there was also a lot of fear and uncertainty about the gov government coming along and imposing a lot more change on the sector. Um, so what, I, what I'm really proud of as I kind of look back over the last six years, um, it's that there has been so much engagement from the financial advice sector. You've been really engaged in these changes You've provided feedback to consultation after consultation. You've turned up to these. You've talked to us. Um, so while, again, not everyone will agree on exactly where everything's landed, I'm really proud of um, the changes we've made throughout this review, taking on board your feedback. Um, and I'm, I've really actually just enjoyed meeting personally so many financial advisors. Cool. Thank you, Derek. Yeah, look, I agree. I think they, um, the last few years, it's been the opportunity, I think, to meet so many people and have so many conversations. And what I think I'm most proud of is now is the fact that so many people think that it's uh, they're happy and comfortable coming up and saying hello and having a chat and, and willing to talk to us. And I think <clears throat> we've come a long way um, from the early days of fear of standing in front of advisor audiences and ducking and diving as various <laughs> rotten fruit was thrown in the early days. So I think we've come a long way, and I, I think, um, you know, and I'm very proud of where the sector's got to. I've seen it grow in confidence. And I'm also proud, too, by the way, um, of my colleagues here today who have, who have kind of, I sort of throw that down at the start, was actually be bolder about the conversations that we have about money and the meaning it means in our own lives. And we've heard those stories up here today. And I think that's fantastic. We need more of it. 
The code stands on a foundation of consultation and I'm immensely grateful to everybody who has helped in that journey of consulting with us and getting to where we've got to. Thank you. Yeah, some, similar to, to the others around um, just the, the way everyone has been quite open and prepared to engage um, with us. Um, I must admit for me as well, having spent a fair amount of my time on the other side of the fence, um, there's still lots to learn and we continue to learn and be open with each other um, in our communications. Um, and I, I leave you with our Waldorf and Statler story um, at the beginning of our journey, Derek and I um, having a, a chat to an audience and two old blokes yelled out um, to us, you've got no idea what you're talking about. Um, and I, I ran to hide behind a pillar and Derek stood out in front and says, but I'm an AFA. And he said, well, you can't have been any good then because you've joined the dark side. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> not sure about Thanks, that. John. And look, I think it starts at the top, and it was interesting yesterday to hear Minister Clark talk about three words that are dear to my heart and I know also to Angus's heart. Um, and he talked about wanting people to be wise, informed and motivated. And they were the words that Chris Farfoy came out with about four to five years earlier. Mm. And so clearly um, Richard talked about the baton being passed. Uh, the minister talked about wanting to engage with the industry. The regulators today have shown you another side. We've kind of peeled back the onion, moved away from that regulation. And I think um, hopefully that's given you some understanding. Lots of questions about the company's office, so as Sharon said, there is a stall down there, and for those in the digital community, yes, there will be links available, so I'll make sure that these questions get put through to the events team and that they do get published. I'm immensely proud of you as advisors, um, as an advice community. I have an advisor, and that advisor makes me set my goals every year, and my this year I'll pick up money from Jacinda, so there you go. And uh, that's interesting in its own right. But, um, you know, I am proud of the work you do, and I do want us to be a really excellent uh, financial advisory community, and I think we're well on our way to doing that. So thank you, panellists, for your time this morning, and thank you, everybody, for your uh, participation.